Well, I want to welcome each and every one of you to a brand new series that I'm really excited about. We're calling it This Summer Being a Summer of Foundations. And so we're excited about the summer growing in our foundations, but also really uh, an entire summer journey. I want to look in the camera there, welcome our McKinney campus, our Hazlitt campus, welcome all of you that are joining us online as well, maybe someone watching this message later. Let's put our hands together and welcome everybody that's joining in with us. Now, for some of you that have been here for a little bit, when I say we're going to take a journey, you're thinking about one of our spiritual campaigns, and I just want to kind of clue you into that. We are going to take our annual spiritual journey campaign starting at the first of the year. We fast and pray. We have all of our groups going. We usually give you a study guide to go through. Uh, and of course, we have the weekend messages. Uh, this is a, a little bit like that, but very different because uh, we won't have the small group component with this journey because we have a lot of other things happening this summer. Uh, I'm so excited about all of you that are going through freedom this summer. Uh, I want to, yeah, I'm, I, that's always a great, amazing thing. Um, I, I would ask you to pencil that in and make it part of something that you do as part of what we do here at Milestone. But also we have a, a lot of you that'll be going through our growth track. This is a time of year. By the way, Milestone family, I know it's summer, but we have a lot of people in the summertime that are moving and making transitions. And so be who you are to them, be friendly, but also point them to the steps in our growth track, which also include a small group journey. But I'm excited about this summer. This summer is going to be a time of equipping and a time of strengthening you in your faith. And I, I've been really looking forward to the time we're going to share together. And by the way, again, if you're traveling a little bit, uh, how many of y'all going to go to the mountains this, this summer? Anybody going to the mountain? A lot of y'all, I don't know, maybe online. How many of y'all going to the beach? A lot of y'all going to the beach. My wife's going to drag me to the beach sometime in July. She likes to sit on the beach all day. It's not good for bald men to sit in the sun all day. It's like a solar panel, just raising your temperature all the time. But anyway, I realize you'll do a little bit of traveling this summer, but I encourage you to go online, watch the messages. And in this, we do have for you, we have a resource for you that we're very excited about. It's our foundations book. And I, I want this book to not only be something for you personally, but I want it to be a tool. I'm going to show you this is a, a tool. By the way, you as the church family of Milestone, I always just love to put that out there. It's only for a few people, but I just it makes people be at ease. Like I don't make any personal money off of these resources, okay? So you are my church family. I'm not putting these things up there for my personal benefit. We create these resources for you to be able to use them to help you fulfill what God's plan is for your life. So have you ever been trying to fix something and you didn't have the right tool? You didn't have the right Allen wrench. You didn't have the right screwdriver. You know, it can be frustrating. And I'm going to show you that this is a tool that you really want to utilize in your personal life as also in your faith and in your walk with Jesus. And so this is a tool that I want you to always know is right there on the shelf to be utilized. We're going to talk a little bit about that this first week. But also, if you have a tool and you don't know how to use it, you need a YouTube video. Y'all know what I'm saying? There, come on now. I mean, you know that's what you do. You got your DIY project. You're like, I have no idea how to do this. I think I'm going to YouTube it. Some person I've never met lives in Idaho somewhere in their basement. There they are showing you how to use the tool. So we've got a training video, an equipping video that'll help make this tool accessible for you and help you with all the questions and the barriers and things that you need. Here's what we're using the tool for. Our word for this year is discipleship. 2024, I kicked off the year and I talked about this word being discipleship. And you're like, why would we make that a word for the year? Well, it's Jesus's word. You, you, you can't spend any time in the gospels and not see that Jesus is not just trying to amass 
uh, people together, he very clearly in every gospel in the first of Acts, I love the Matthew version, he says, go into all the world and don't just gather people and don't just discuss things. I have an intentional purpose for what I want you to do. I want you to make disciples. Make disciples. So at some point in your journey, if you read the word, you are going to have to grapple with that he's looking for followers who also equip other followers. And and yet, what I find is a lot of people, they know that, like a lot of things in the Bible, they know it, but it seems so far away. Let me make it very simple for you. Discipleship is when a Christ follower helps another person take their next step. In fact, Jesus not only said make disciples, he said baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're celebrating that at all our campuses. Isn't it so moving to see moms and their children and see people who are agnostic, who are putting their faith in Jesus Christ, seeing people, they're, 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 they're bringing someone into the baptismal waters like we just experienced. I saw all of you. They're just, it's a moving thing because it's a visible display that we're not just doing activity, people are being translated. This is not a self-help program. This is, I was once dead in my sin, but Jesus, who rose from the dead, is alive today, and he's changing people in our midst. And, And so that's a step in the discipleship journey along the way. I want to say up front, as we get ready for this series, you will hear in my voice a unique passion. You will hear like an excitement about this. I I don't know that every Christian, you know, is like discipleship. This sounds like a boring series. I'd rather have five ways to have a body by God, you know, three ways to get more money. I get fired up about it. I look back on my life. You know, I don't know if you ever do this, but do you ever see moments in your life where God introduces you to something not by way of information, but by way of revelation that changes the trajectory of your life. I was impacted by discipleship at an early age. My pastor actually took me into his home on Wednesday nights and took me through foundations early in my life. That's why here at Milestone, young people, as you see them leading and you see them flourishing, it's more than a youth program. It's when these young people in our church hear me say, you don't have to wait till you're old to be great. You can be a great kid. They believe it because it's on the inside of me and it's in the culture of our church. My pastor let me preach when I was 16 years old. He believed I didn't have to wait till I was old to be great. And then in my early 20s, I began, I don't know how to explain this, you know, there's things that you know in the Bible and there's things that you know at a deeper level and I made a conscious choice that with my life I didn't just want to be a communicator, I love to communicate God's word, but I didn't want to be a a, a super influencer or a a, a super speaker, I I wanted to be a super developer, a a super people builder, a super coach, and and, and it looked kind of crazy because discipleship is things that are kind of hidden and not seen and not celebrated, and and, and I started early on with a vision to, to make disciples. First church that I pastored, middle of central Texas, little building there. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors. There were five mad Baptists in there. <laughs> My wife and I, we started leading small groups. We, it was before small groups were cool. It's not like a church growth strategy. We were leading small groups. Why? Because a disciple maker needs an environment to make disciples. So we invited people to our house and started discipling people. And I got a picture for my life. I've done 275 101s. We're doing 101 this weekend. 275 101s. And I tell people, I say, look, if you're going to come here, you need to know my picture. My picture is not the winning strategy, the most important thing, the crescendo of Christianity would be to gather just the largest crowd and talk to them. If that's the goal, then we need to find the biggest venue in DFW, fill it up. Probably Texas Motor Speedway. Everybody can bring their RVs. We can fill it up, maybe put everybody on the lawn. I think 300,000 people would be in there. Maybe some of them will be sober. 
And uh, I could get out there on a microphone and today I'm considering myself the luckiest preacher on the face of the earth, of the earth, of the earth. That illustration is too old for some of you. You don't, you don't, know, you don't know what it is. But. And, and you know what I would know? I would walk off the stage and go, I, I would preach the gospel if they, ha- if they gather those people. I'll preach the gospel to, to a dog running down the street. But I would know that it's not the ultimate goal is that those people be equipped to walk out their faith. So early in my early 20s, I got a picture not to just be someone who talks to crowds of people, but to be able to say on my deathbed, there's a group of people that I've poured everything I have into them, not that I'm the complete package. I've introduced them to a Jesus they learn how to follow where they say to me on my deathbed, going home to Jesus, we'll take it from here. That's a, that's a very distinct picture. So when you hear me talk, you're tying into my passion. You may think I'm tying in just to my personality, but I want you to know it's also a principle from God's word. And my goal in our time together this summer is to make it accessible to you. Now, when you talk about a foundation, it's not the glamorous part of the building. I've never seen a realtor say, hey, let me tell you, first thing I want to show you, the foundation. Like, wow, that's exciting. Anyone who knows how important it is knows we better have somebody check that. But you don't start with that. They don't put those pictures on the real estate websites like, hey, everybody, our first photo, the foundation. But you know what? We're all building something. All of us are building something. Everybody listening to me this weekend, you're like, why should I engage with this series? Because you are a group of builders. You're building businesses. You're you're building families. By the way, in our family series every year, I tell parents, don't just parent your children, disciple your children because you want them to love the God that you love. So show them how. I, wanna, I don't want to just make that statement. I want us this summer to make that real and accessible in our lives. You're building businesses. You're building families. You're building your life. And the truth is, no one that I've ever met doesn't want to go higher. No, no one I've ever met. I, mean, I want to go up. I want to go up to, and as your pastor... I want you to reach the potential that God has for your life. Up is a relative term. Some of us get a little older in life and realize that what the world describes as up is not always up. But what I am saying is you want to reach your potential and you want to go higher. Everyone says, I want to go up. But here's the principle from Scripture. If you want to go up, you got to dig down deeper. Because as you go up, you have to be able to sustain what it is that God is doing in your life. And sometimes you can feel a little limited. You can feel a little held back. Some of you may feel that way right now. It's like, man, this I, I'm wanting to go here. And maybe God did give you a vision, but let me encourage you that you're probably making a little more progress. God's, God's working in the unseen realm to prepare you always for where he's taking you. So let's start with this idea of foundations. Like, Is that a biblical concept? Like, how do I make that real in my life? We have to start at A number one, first place. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. What is the basis that we start on? 1 Corinthians 3.10 says, By the grace of God that he's given me, this is the Apostle Paul talking, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. See, we're... We're a part of the foundation that was laid. Paul seeing, okay, look, we're not just doing activity. I'm laying a foundation that, look what he says, and someone else is building on it. But this is a principle always with foundations. Each person should build with care. But here's the principle that I want you to get very first, very beginning, first message, summer of foundations. No one can lay any other foundation other than one that is already laid That is Jesus Christ. So the ultimate foundational principle is, is Jesus the center of your life? 
Have you surrendered yourself to Jesus? I want to know what Jesus thinks. I want to know what his priorities are. I want, to, I want to build my life on the foundation of the revelation of Jesus Christ. You might think this summer when I say, hey, we're going to get these, these summer of foundations, we're going to talk about the anchor truths of being a follower of Jesus Christ. But you might think I'm talking about rules and I, I'm talking about religious lessons and and maybe, you know, even though we want to give you some help with a practical video, you might think I'm talking about techniques, because we're a technique culture. Like, give me the technique. You might think I'm just talking about some deep spiritual insights, but what this summer is ultimately about is, is growing closer to Jesus. I, I want to get closer to Jesus. I want to I wanna care about what he cares about. I want to be motivated by what he's motivated by. Now, when you talk about the Bible pattern of foundations, it's all the way through Scripture you see these principles. We're all building something, okay? In fact, there's a psalm that I love, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. What a frustrating activity to spend a lot of energy on something that can't be sustained. So there's, we're all building something. We're all building on a foundation, Jesus is the only firm foundation, and here's another principle when you study foundational teachings through the scriptures, everything you're building will be tested. I, I grew up in a home, um, though I, put, I got none of the transfer of exactly how to build practical buildings and things. Um, God had a different path for me at 12 years old. I was called to ministry supernaturally by the Holy Spirit, and so I began to move down the track of not building buildings, but building people, though I've had to build a few buildings along the way to build people, but really primarily, I, I began down this people-building path, but I grew up in the home of a draftsman and an engineer. So in my home, there were drafting tables. My dad actually would, before CAD, for churches, he would for free draw what we use now in 3D graphics and motion and all of that. He would draw like the landscape of churches for churches so that churches could get a vision for what they're building. Because it's very hard to get a bunch of people excited about building a church building and show them plans of a foundation. They're like, man, I want to know where the gym is. Like, I want to know where the bathroom is. I want to know where the parking lot is. So my dad would do that. And still to this day, just so you know, I'm, I, I, am, I am wired to think about building things that last. I'm, I, I grew up in a home where if you're going to build it, build it right. Make sure it can be sustained. So even in our war room, this is up in the area, we call it our war room, where we gather and we plan stuff for you and we pray and we plan series like this and we have a drafting table because we've got a few projects always going here and that's a locomotive that my dad designed. I'm just trying to give you a little background in, in this reality. Here's something just by the way I grew up, but also from understanding this from scripture, but also from being a people builder and now I'm at a phase in my life where Matt Addington's kids were getting baptized and I sit in the audience, that happens to me all the time and I start crying because I know Matt Addington, I knew him before I was married and I'm watching his girls with life on them get water baptized. I'm now at the place where I'm seeing some of the structures that are being built on the foundations. So I get excited about it. But I need you to personally get motivated towards it. And here's something I want to encourage you with, because that unseen work of the foundation is not always glamorous and very under-celebrated in our culture. If you're in a foundation-building time, you're making more progress than you think. You're, wake, you're making way more progress than you think. Like, it's not seen, it's not celebrated. I remember the structure we're in here at the Keller campus when we we're building the foundation. There were special companies and they had to get the soil right. They had these machines out here and they were injecting water. And, and man, I would come here, I was like, man, when are we gonna get some walls? Man, it seemed like it took forever. 
But did you know we were making progress? We were making progress to what we're seeing today, but in that moment, it seemed like we were making very little progress. Five services behind Taco Casa, people parking at the high school, but we were making progress. It's just not always seen. I began to think about foundation passages in the Bible. If you have your Bible, Psalm 11, 3 is an interesting foundation passage. Let me give you the context. David is the author of the psalm, but what's going on is Saul, now God has anointed and and has been preparing David, but Saul is the king. And Saul is an immoral leader, and Saul is, is, is not building according to God's pattern. There is a principle in scripture, when the righteous rule, the people flourish. And so not only David, but others are like, frustrated with, in fact, David right here is frustrated with unrighteousness seemingly winning. I don't know if you've ever faced that in your life where it's like my business is being impacted by people that are doing it in an unrighteous way. My my family or this, or even you may feel what I hear people today, man, our culture that righteousness is being, being, being thwarted and it's like, are, are, are unrighteous people flourishing? David's kind of in one of those moments. By the way, his friends tell him to run. David is able to stand just because of what is contained in this little psalm. He does make the statement, which is true, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? I did a little research on that, and scholars believe that if you take and take a little deeper look at the Hebrew, this is for all of our lives. I want you to let the Word of God speak to you about foundations, that another way of phrasing that might be, when the foundations are destroyed, what happens to the tower? What happens to the superstructure? Man, we've all seen that. Something that looks real good on the outside. Looks real pretty on the outside. Looks real glamorous on the outside, only to crumble because the foundation could not support the structure. Many times, you can even be promoted beyond your character level and think you are winning, but if you're promoted beyond your character, it can be one of the most damaging things in your life. But David is here going, man, what do we do? I hear people in our culture today saying, what do we do? Like, like, like what is wrong is being celebrated as right, and what is right is being said that it's wrong. And, 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 I, and I always have a heart for young families today because some of us, as you get a little further down the road, we can easily be painting a picture that there's no hope in our world today. But let me just tell you, we're not the darkest culture that's ever been. We're not, if you read the Bible, there's greater darkness that's been on the earth. And David says it this way, here's how you maintain hope when your boss is not good, when your whatever is not. He says this, I know this, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. At the end of the day, what the Bible says to us is it keeps pressing us to where do we ultimately put our hope? Who is the ultimate king of all kingdoms? And so, but the principle here is this foundational understanding of the tower being affected by the foundation. It's something that, quite honestly, I love to do is is to help people grow in their foundations. By the way, the early part of Milestone Church, we're meeting in a capitorium. We, we didn't have an elaborate small group structure to, like we do today. We didn't have, you know, online check-in for your small group. We just had an organic group of people taking a book like this foundations book and helping people grow in their foundations. I, I've seen so much fruit in just gathering people and saying, hey, Let's learn the basics. Let's learn the blocking and tackling. Let's learn the actual essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You never outgrow the need to grow in your foundations if you're going where God's called you to go. 
You always maintain a posture. There's more strength. There's more rebar. There's more concrete. There's something God wants to reveal to me. But here's something I want to propose to some of you, that a portion of this as well is equipping you to give it away to someone else. Because you may say, man, I know it. I know these things about the Bible. I've learned this. I've learned that. But do you really know it if you've never helped someone else know it? Because a disciple is not just a retainer of information. A disciple is someone who makes disciples. I want to talk about strengthening your foundation. How do you strengthen it? How do we get a hold of this? First of all, we have to realize that, and this is what we're going to learn in this journey this summer, we realize that it's a process more than it's an event. We are an event culture. StubHub, get your event tickets, go to the event. We become event-oriented in church. We can become, hey, when I say summer of foundations, a lot of us, I talk about strengthening your foundation. When I talk about like preparing for where you're going to go, most of us think about there's going to be this crescendo spiritual moment And so we think, when we think go deeper, we think that we're talking about profound spiritual moments, but in Scripture, the journey is more important than the event. Think about the disciples of Jesus. They had important events with Jesus. Some of them didn't come to some, and some were at all, and you know, I think about just a few went to the Mount of Transfiguration, but all of them saw Jesus do multiple miracles. But at the end of the day, they didn't even a lot of times know how to interpret exactly what they were experiencing. The power of it was not the big moments. And God's okay with us having big moments. But we don't stop at the moment. It's all about the journey. And so when I look at those disciples, they didn't understand a lot of times. But what they were gleaning from is the three and a half years that they got the impartation of Jesus' life. And so I love to always remind people of this, that God's not into perfection in your life, but he is into progress. That's why we say we're not a mob of people, we're a family taking our next step. What does God ask of each of us? It doesn't matter where we're at in our journey, take the next step that's in front of you. And so this is a discipleship journey. I was with a young leader this last week. Thoroughly enjoyed my time with this young leader. In fact, this, this young leader came to me and had a list of questions. Like, I, wanna, I, I thought, man, that's amazing, by the way. It's like he was ready to learn. As we unpack those questions and as I listened to him, first of all, let me say this. You always grow more when you're mentoring and helping and encouraging somebody else than you ever grow when you're just by yourself. Because because I'm with him and I'm not living in a study somewhere with, with, with just, just to, because I'm with people, here's what I learned when I was with him. I'm like, I've forgotten some of the battles that he has. It makes me a better communicator too because when you're someone who's with other people, you're like, oh, I know what they're feeling. I know, man, I remember that. But here's what I picked up on. We are a give me the widget. Give me the strat. Tell me what action can I do to create this result? There are actions that you can take to create results But let me talk to you about a bigger picture of Scripture. It's more African. It's more Eastern than it is American. Really, at the end of the day, what I had to share with him is, because you keep your heart open, because you're willing to stay humble, because you're even asking questions, God's doing it. You can't see it right now. It's more about he's pushing insecurities out of you. He's helping you as you take steps. How many of y'all have lived a little bit longer in life? Y'all know what I'm saying? You look back and go, I thought it was the action. It wasn't the action. It was actually the process of the journey of what God was doing inside of me. So we got to think process. we got to think journey. Here's the second thing. This is a principle of foundations. We prioritize living it over just knowing it. We live in a culture today that we believe the most Mature person at the small group is the person that can win the Bible quiz. I know that. I know this. We have a download of information today. 
I, I, again, nothing wrong with knowing things about Scripture and knowing things about God. But when you study the concept of knowing in Scripture, the Bible doesn't use knowing like we use knowing. In fact, the Bible says you can have a lot of knowledge and you can be puffed up and arrogant. Can I tell you, I know people who have been in church forever. They know everything about the Bible. They're, in, they're terribly ineffective. Because why? You need to relearn what you know. Because the Bible does not encourage, hey, I know it. The Bible encourages, I know it so I can live it. I should become more Christ-like, more humble, more curious, more open. And you're like, well, I already know all that. You need to re-know it. Because you've missed the essence of it. Discipleship is not just about knowing. Discipleship is about taking the life of Christ and being able to be what he has called us to be and be Christ-like. I know a lot about makeup. I know you're surprised. I have three daughters. There's copious amounts of makeup. Y'all have heard me tell the story. They invade. Last night. They got to come in. Get, why is your makeup in my bathroom? You can put your makeup in. They like to come crowd in there. You know, girls, they go to the bathroom in herds. You know, men don't talk. What's up? Women go together. So, I mean, I'll get, I'll get makeup on my toothbrush. I've learned that about relationships. Relationships mean sometimes you just brush with it on there. And so my girls, I know a lot, man. I know about Dior lip oil because Lainey got some. And she's too young, and her older sisters are like, why do you have the bougie lip oil? You shouldn't even have it, you know? I mean, and my other daughter told me, yeah, Dad, on TikTok, like 12-year-olds are invading Sephora with their parents' credit card, griping about anti-aging cream. And they're like, give it to me, you know? It's like, you don't need it. You're 12. <laughs> I I'll share with you a, a deeper, more transparent thing with y'all. I, I wear makeup from time to time. Actually, they make me wear makeup. That video that you see, I don't look that good in real life. I mean, I got suntan lines and crow's feet, but they paint me for those videos. I just want you to know that. They put copious amounts of makeup on me. Her, her name is Janice. I tell her, put a little dark line to, to put the dark line, inhibit the chinchilla line. I, I say, hey, help with the chinchilla on a brother. Y'all know what I'm saying? But I know a lot about makeup, but you don't want me putting makeup on you. I don't know how to do makeup. I know one thing about makeup. After you get it on you, your favorite moment is when you take it off. Now I know why my girls are always come and get makeup wipes. Because, man, I get them makeup wipes. Do you know it takes a lot of makeup wipes to get makeup off your face? That's enough about makeup. My point is... <laughs> I know about healthy eating. That doesn't mean I know how to eat healthy. I know a lot about the gym. I know a lot about golf, but that doesn't mean I can hit it. Y'all know where I'm going here? There's a lot of people that have missed this thing. I know a lot about it. There's only one problem. What you have, nobody wants. So there has to be this transfer from knowing here to the gnosko of the Bible, knowing in my heart so it becomes part of my life. Here's number three, strengthening the foundation. We always grow faster. We grow stronger when we give it away instead of just focusing on ourselves. I love this passage from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter five, he says this, we have much to say about this. But it's hard to make it clear to you because you're no longer trying to understand. Can I offer something to you about Christ-like followers who strengthen their foundation? They don't arrive. They stay hungry. They're, they're curious. They're like, Lord, I'm open in my heart to what you want to do. He says to them, you're not trying anymore. You're not, you're not trying to understand. In fact, though by this time he says this, he says, by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone, though, to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word. Look at this all over again. You think you're eating meat, but you're actually on milk. And what he's saying is the, the, the challenge there is somehow, some way, in your experience, you never transition from 
just consuming information to saying, I'm going to disciple my kids. I'm going to disciple that person at work. I'm going to pour my life into someone around me. I double dog dare you, you'll grow more than you've ever grown before. Because the teacher always grows more than the student. I've been preaching this message here at Milestone, by the way. Some of you that are new, you're like, man, this sounds like a working church. You're like, man, this sounds... No, I've been preaching this since the beginning. Like we're all part of God's team. We don't all just wear uniforms. We don't sit in stands. We're part of the team. In fact, back at Willis Lane, one of our first buildings, I preached on it one weekend. Back then, man, I just... It was about Jesus in about an hour. We're going to get out of here in just a minute. Anyway... And I was panting around preaching, and in the middle of it, I'd heard this statistic that week that 85% of people will attend church their whole life and never participate in the Great Commission. Never lead someone to the saving knowledge of Christ. Never bring a lost person to church. Never pour themselves out. And I, and I was just like stirred up about it. I'm like, we're declaring war on that statistic. Like, it cannot be that 85% of people read the real Bible and never actually become people who give it away. So I was like, imagine if you were preaching next weekend. I went out to shake hands like I always do. A guy came out and he goes, Pastor, I have my message. I'm ready to preach. I was like, ha, 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 joke. You didn't get it. Anyway, so, but let's think about it for a minute. No, I'm not letting you preach next weekend. That's not going to happen. But you are preaching all week to your family, to the people around you, to the people in your boardroom. You may be the only Bible that they ever read or ever see. And so we're all part of the message of Jesus. There's this psychological term called the protege effect. When you have a protege, you don't pro procrastinate. You're more intentional. You think more about what you're doing. It, it, it causes you to evaluate your growth when you have someone that you're giving it away to. Now I want to ask you at all campuses to do me a favor. I'm going to have you stand, but I'm going to ask you. We're like two, three minutes away, but I'm going to have you stand. Let's, let's not dismiss yet. I want to give you this last point standing up because I think you might be able to receive it. Let's all stand. Wait. Unless it's an emergency, wait just a minute because I want to pray for all of you. This whole foundation series, it comes from a story from Jesus in his most famous sermon. In his most famous sermon, he says, there are two builders. How many of y'all were here when the wise builder and the foolish builder, Dr. Tony Evans, preached here that message? Was that amazing? Like, I can't even get close to Dr. Tony Evans. He has taught me so much. He is so amazing. But I'm going to try real quick. Here's the story. There's these two builders. One builds on sand. One builds on the rock. And the reality is he brought us to this understanding that we always think about, oh, I don't want my house to fall down. A lot of us think about with all these storms recently, you know, you're like, man, there's a storm coming. The storms come. But the, the, the real pointed truth of the passage is they both heard the story. They both had the information. But the wise builder is the one who put it into practice that transition from your Bible being information to transformation was the key of the story. So what are we doing this summer? We're trying to close that gap. What am I asking you to do? Engage at all campuses, online, even if you're traveling, follow the message. Get a book. Go all of us in the next few days. Watch that training video. It'll help you and equip you. And here's what I'm really asking you to do. Have an open heart. Say, God, you want to do something in me this summer. Some of you, you're new to Christ. You're new to faith. It's going to put foundations in you. Some of you need some of your foundations shored up. Some of you have a pretty strong foundation, and God's going to move you to stop just being an absorber but help you start giving it away. Let's all bow our heads right now. First of all, somebody listening, you haven't built on the foundation of Christ with your life. Your house is shaking. Right where you are, you can simply say, Jesus, come into my life. I surrender my life to you, wherever you're listening to me from. I give you my life. I surrender my life to you. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead. If you prayed that prayer like we're celebrating at all our campuses, water baptism, I'm going to ask you to let us know so we can now help you grow in your relationship with Christ. Second of all, Lord, we ask that your grace would be on this journey with us this summer. 
strengthening us, growing us, developing us, revealing to us cracks, revealing to us unsubmitted areas, revealing to us more of you, Jesus, so that we can be Christ-like followers of you in Jesus' name.